All right, welcome to Harvard New One. So glad you guys have joined us here and be streaming online. We're going to begin with a call to worship. Uh, it is a time when we read a passage of scripture that reminds us of who God is and what he has done. This is from Psalm 96, verses 1 and 2. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Go to prayer. Father, thank you for your salvation. Jesus, who is our salvation, who has rescued us uh, from sin and death, and who has brought us into your family. And we want to respond to your great salvation, the great work you've done in our hearts through singing, through hearing and responding to your word, through fellowshipping together here uh, in this building and online. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, you would uh, open the eyes of our hearts that we would stand in awe of who you are. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As it's comfortable, you can join us in standing as we wish. Oh, that's true. 
thank you for your unfailing love that we've sung that uh, demonstrated this love by Jesus dying on the cross. Uh, Father, for demonstrating your love in the giving of Jesus, your one and only Son. And we pray we would rest today in your love that you have already uh, poured out into our hearts through uh, the Holy Spirit. We also want to pray, Lord, for just the many churches that are meeting uh, in our city, uh, who have already met uh, on our islands, and pray that we continue through your church uh, to reach many people on our island uh, with the gospel. We pray today, Lord, you would use your word in our time together here to draw us to a deeper love and affection uh, for Jesus, and that will translate into a love for our neighbors. So we pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, welcome you guys. How's it going? Uh, welcome to Harvard New Luana. So glad you're joining us here online. Uh, we're going to transition now. Where uh, I'm going to call Jada for an announcement. So get comfy in your spots, and Jada will be coming up and give us a few announcements. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome all of you here in service, as well as streaming online with us. I'm happy to spend the first half of this year already coming to a close. Um, so first off in our announcements is we have gospel community groups um, still going on and so you're welcome to still join us to come and grow in your relationship with Jesus alongside other believers and um, in Christ. And there's more information. We have um, different groups on different days of the week at different times. So you can go ahead and check out our website at harbornewam.org. Um, also today, after service, there will be no refreshments, um, but you're free to um, join the neighborhood at, at the different eateries here, um, even down the street at Al Moana. There's many great options. And lastly, we um, give, Jesus gave his life for us, and so in response to his sacrifice, um, one of the ways we worship him is through financial giving and to advance the good news that we've once heard and believed, um, we offer it back to him in that way. And so um, you can go ahead and give online through our website, and that's by tapping the give um, button there. Uh, we, per we do not have an uh, offering box here um, on site, so. That's it for now, and yeah. So, thank you so much, Jay. So much. It's great to, to be here, see you guys' faces, and enjoy this AC. I just want to uh, praise God for Harbor Honolulu. Uh, they just use their building and their air condition. This is the coolest I've been all day. Just being stuck in the, our house that is just so super humid. So, it's so nice uh, to, be, uh, to be here and to see you guys. Well, we're launching a new uh, sermon series in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy, as we uh, have a ton of the series focus. Focus. And so, uh, if you got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles on your phone, you can tap that app and hop on to 2 Timothy chapter. We look at focus on the gospel. Focus on the gospel. Um, so we live, as you guys know, in just crazy, changing time. But 2020 has felt like just a roller coaster of events and circumstances in our individual lives, on our island, in our nation, in our world. It's just, uh, we've been going in just unpredictable directions from the beginning of the year. And gosh, we're not done yet, right? We've not hit the middle of the year, July yet. And yet we're experiencing just a lot of different changes, changes in our daily lives, changes. As I'm hearing a lot of you guys just share about your work experience and how they're just different. Uh, at the workplace, things are different in relationships, different for those of us who are going to school or teach, it's, it's totally different now. Uh, there's a lot of modifications, policies and procedures, and uh, we know that, that there's going to continue to be changes uh, going on in our lives. And uh, even the way we gather together on a Sunday, right? Before all of this, we were gathering in the morning, and not in my elementary, but with all the changes, we're here, uh, here meeting in uh, the afternoon. And when when we go through life and living through a lot of changes, it's easy, I don't know for me, to get super thrown off, where um, 
the purposes and the, the reasons that I do things get thrown out because I'm so focused on all the changes that I need to, uh, to adjust to. And that throws me off as far as, wait, why am I doing even the things that I'm doing because of all these changes? I kind of like it to, you know when you go to a shopping, um, <clears throat> when you go to a, a large department store, and you go in with a purpose, like whether okay, I need to get toilet paper at Costco, or I need to get this type of ingredient to cook at, at Target. And you go in, I go in the store, and then you start getting distracted by all these different sales, all these different new items, and the plan is going for one thing. And we end up staying for an hour in the store, and we end up coming out with 10 things. And then uh, when you leave the store, you realize, oh my gosh, I totally didn't get the thing I had planned to get. Uh, and, and I've done that before, where I, I go into the store with, with, with a purpose, but leave with a totally different purchase. And that's what life can kind of feel like right now, is we, we're, we have so many different changes that we're trying to adapt to that we forget what our purpose is in the workplace. We forget what our goal is in our families and in our relationships. We forget the reason why we are going to school. And so things can get very thrown off. And as we dive into 2 Timothy, Paul is going to help us in refocusing on our purpose in life. See, Paul was writing this letter to Timothy, a friend and his protege, someone who did ministry uh, together with uh, with him. And Paul is in prison at this time. He's in a dirty uh, dungeon, dark dungeon, awaiting trial as it comes to the end of his life. So he wasn't just uh, quarantined. Uh, he was jailed. He was in prison. He was in a place he did not want to be and it was not like uh, what, what we have experienced. You know, I don't know if some of you guys saw on, on, the, on the news or uh, certain celebrities posting on social media their quarantine life in their mansions. And people are giving them a hard time because they're, you know, they're kind of pretending like they're suffering, quarantine, in their huge mansion. Well, Paul was not, that was not Paul's experience. He was in a dungeon awaiting trial, coming to the end of his life, and he is distant from his friends and from his loved ones. And so in his personal letter, he's writing to Timothy, his friend, his protege, uh, and, and, and it's, a, it's a super intimate letter. In 1 Timothy, when, uh, the, that letter that Paul wrote, which, which we went over at the beginning of the year, which feels like longer than that, right? Uh, it was about the church structure, the policies, the procedures of the gathering of God's people. But in 2 Timothy, it's really personal, and it, it, it's from one heart to another heart. Paul to Timothy. And Paul is calling Timothy to focus upon what is important as, as Paul is giving us his the, the last words that, that he that has just recorded and given to us. So think about that. When when we come to the end of our lives, when our loved ones, when they came to the end of their lives, right, they're thinking through what is what really do people need to hear at this time? Uh, when my dad passed away, um, we were surrounded, our family was surrounded uh, him at, in, in the hospital bed and he shared with us his what was deep in his heart and his concerns for our family. And I remember to this day what he shared with me because uh, his last words, he wanted to share what was most pressing on his heart. And here, Paul, in his last days, he's sharing what is on his heart to Timothy. And what, what we're going to look at uh, today is how the focus should be on the gospel, the good news, of Jesus, and the effects that it should have, the good news should have, on our lives. So uh, we're going to dive right in verse 1 of uh, chapter 1, which is Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. Timothy, my beloved child, not biological, but, but what it seems is that as, as God used Paul to bring Timothy to the faith, to lead Timothy to Jesus, the spiritual son. It says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. Back in verse 1, Paul just sets up the letter by, by saying, here's what life really is. Life is in Christ 
Jesus. In other words, we find, and he's focusing us here, we find true purpose, meaning, and satisfaction in this life, in the life to come, in Jesus, in the gospel. Right? Jesus didn't come to earth to make bad people try to be good. That wasn't his mission. If that was the mission, then Jesus could have came down to earth, could have told people, hey, be good, follow the rules, and back up to heaven. But Jesus didn't come to make bad people try to be good. Jesus came to make dead people live. And that is through faith in Jesus' death and resurrection for us. For us, and that's the good news. It's what Jesus has done by dying on the cross and rising again from the dead. And so this life is found in Jesus. He gives us life through faith in him. He gives us a new heart to experience him personally, to experience him through the church family. He gives us, and Jesus himself said, he gives us life and life to the fool. And a lot of times we, we forget that, right? Because we often will, will forget that life is found in Jesus and instead think that life is found through the stuff and the blessings that Jesus gives. And we start thinking, okay, it's the stuff that Jesus gives, Jesus gives that's what's going to give you true satisfaction and joy. But no, it's, it's life in Christ Jesus, not life in the blessings uh, that he gives. Right? Think, think about it like this. Like if you go to eat out, if you're comfortable going to eat out uh, at, you know, at, at this time, um, and your experience is kind of based upon how good the food is. If the, if the food and the service is good, then it's a win. Great experience. But, but if, if your purpose and my purpose in going out to eat is to enjoy time with a loved one and friend, that meal could be kind of junk. The service could be kind of not so not, not, uh, not so good, but if you and I got to spend time with that loved one, that family member, that friend, that experience was ultimately rich and meaningful. Because it wasn't about the food or service, it was about time spent with that loved one. See, that's how it is in our life in Christ, that our joy, ultimate joy and satisfaction is not in the stuff that he blesses us with, but it's in the relationship that we have in him. Now these blessings, praise God for them, and God provides for us in, in, in different ways, whether it be through friendships, whether it be through resources, those things are meant to enhance our joy in Jesus. They're not meant to replace our joy in Jesus. So what if we find ourselves like thinking, oh man, I've kind of done that. I've kind of, kind of left that joy in Christ and tried to find it in other things. Uh, what, what, how should we respond? What should we do? Well, Revelation 2, 4, and 5 gives us wisdom on how we can respond. If we find ourselves, man, just missing out on a life in Christ. Let's read Revelation chapter 2, verses uh, 3 through 5. Jesus uh, speaking, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. He's talking to the church, and you've not grown worried, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, uh, from where you have fallen. Repent. And do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your last from this place, unless you repent. This church, and this might describe a lot of us, this church is doing a lot of good things for Jesus. But they left their first love. They left that joy and that uh, satisfaction that's found in the person and the relationship in Jesus. And what Jesus calls them to do is to first remember. Remember that, that love that they have with him. And for us, if we find ourselves in that place, then remember, try to remember that time where you felt so stoked for Jesus, where, where you were just excited for him, where you're excited to share Jesus with other people. Reflect on those times where you would maybe read his word and just be so satisfied, or those times you'd go off alone uh, to a park or whatnot and just enjoy that alone time with him. Just think about it, savor those moments uh, that you had spending time with Jesus. So, first it is to remember, to reflect. The second is to repent, right? To change your minds. It's to realize, oh my gosh, like I've fallen from that that that, that height. Uh, I've fallen from 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 finding joy in Jesus, and I want I want by the power of the Spirit to change. Repent. 
And after that, we do. Do the things that you've done at first. So if it was just blasting praise music in your room, go ahead and blast praise music in your room to Jesus. Uh, if it's just going off into that quiet place and just sitting in his presence, go ahead and do that. Do the things that fuel your love for Jesus. That we would really savor the life we have in Christ. So it starts there. Our, our, our light and our focus in this life starts with the gospel. And then we're going to look at three effects that come from experiencing the gospel. So let's uh, look at verse 3 in 2 Ch- uh, Timothy chapter 1. Paul says this, I thank God for my faith, as did my ancestors with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, the faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Here's the first thing, uh, uh, the the effects of the gospel, when we experience the gospel in our lives. It's having joy for others, knowing Jesus. Paul, as he reflects on Timothy and his life in Jesus, has great joy. Paul is so stoked uh, for Timothy when he thinks about Timothy and Timothy's relationship with Jesus. When we experience the love of Jesus, we get so stoked when others in our lives that we care about come to know Jesus. I kind of think of it like this. When when my kids were learning how to ride a, a bike, I remember just that whole process where first they were in those little plastic preschool cars where your feet are the engine, and then after that they graduated to those tricycles which can tip over and fall so easily, and then they graduated to uh, training wheels, and then finally uh, they were able to ride uh, a regular bike. And I remember being with them on that whole process of learning to ride a bike, and I was so stoked, so joyful. Uh, so happy when they were able to ride uh, a two-wheel bike on their own. Why? Because I know what it feels like. I remember as a kid riding a bike and the joy and the, the satisfaction that that brings. So because of that, I want my kids to experience that same experience. So when it comes to our joy for others, when we experience the love of Jesus, we know how good that feels and how satisfied it is for our souls, we get so when other people in our lives experience the love of Jesus. So that's the first thing. It's one of the effects of the gospel is a joy for others knowing Jesus. The second is experiencing and having a sincere faith. A sincere faith. Back in verse 5, I Paul saying, I'm reminded of Timothy, your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first with your grandmother Lois and your mother uh, Eunice, right? So here Timothy comes from a family where at least his mother and grandmother knew uh, Jesus, were followers of Jesus, were Christians. Uh, for me, I grew up in a Christian home, so I'm, I'm grateful for being taken to church as a young child, to grow up in church as a teenager, and to be around um, people who knew Jesus. And, and that played a big role for me. Uh, for others of us, uh, you have the same experience. While others of us, you didn't, where your parents didn't know Jesus, didn't go to church, uh, and, and so you're the first one, and maybe you're kind of discouraged. But I want to encourage you that it can start with you, that from you can come a heritage of a group of people, family members, experiencing Jesus. And so Timothy had this, and Timothy had experienced the sincere faith of his mother and grandmother, and that had an impact on him. But he himself had a sincere faith in Jesus. What is a sincere faith? It's a faith that doesn't fake it. It's a faith that doesn't pretend to know Jesus, but doesn't really know him. It's one that knows Jesus personally. Knows him personally. It's kind of like the difference between uh, either hearing about a movie that's good and telling people about it, even though you didn't watch that movie, or actually watching that good movie and then telling people about it through experience. You have a lot more excitement if you saw the movie yourself. So someone with a sincere faith has a genuine relationship with Jesus. They're not just following a set of rules or morals. And so maybe for some of us, right, we realize, oh my gosh, like 
that's kind of been my whole experience. Like, we're going to start experiencing morals and rules, but not really the person of Jesus. How do you experience the person of Jesus? And the good news is, is Jesus made the way for that to happen. Through his death and resurrection, when we trust Jesus as our Savior and our King, he, he makes us alive and gives us this real, personal relationship with Christ. And so if we've never experienced that before, it's simply going to Jesus and asking him to have us be born again, to made, be made new. So that's the second thing, is we experience a sincere faith in Jesus. The third thing is the results and the effects of the gospel is spirit-empowered service to others. So let's read verse 6. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, uh, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So Timothy, what was commanded by Paul, to fan into flame the gift God had given him. In other words, to use the gift that God had given uh, to him in his teaching, in his pastoring of the church. And so God has given all of his people gifts to use, not on ourselves, but to serve other people in our lives. And so we're to use those gifts by the power of the Holy Spirit. So maybe for some of us, God has given us this extraordinary amount of mercy, of mercy. And we might feel at times totally exhausted in listening to another person and listening to the problems and praying for them. And we might feel like, oh man, I think I'm, I'm empty. The tank is empty. Or we might feel that, oh, you know, uh, driving to that, 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 uh, that, that place to meet a person to encourage them. Or uh, serving uh, that family member. It's just so exhausting. We don't have the energy and strength to do it. The good news is that through the Holy Spirit, we have the power to be able to serve others with that gift of, of, of mercy. Other of us, maybe we have the gift of teaching or the gift of encouraging. And maybe we're struggling with our motives. And we think, oh man, I'm, I'm struggling with like using my gift in a loving way. I, I think I'm doing it out of selfishness. I'm doing it out of attention. I'm doing it out of people to like me or to respect me. The good news is God gave us his Holy Spirit. And it says here that that we have a spirit of power, but also of love. Romans 5 says that God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And one of the reasons he does that is so that when we serve others who are teaching, who are encouraging, who are using our gifts, it can be out of love for them. Because we first experience God's love for us, we can now in turn serve others with the love that he has given to us. Maybe for some of us, when it comes to using the gifts God has given us, uh, we're fearful. We're fearful of messing up. We're fearful of criticism. Uh, we're fearful that we won't measure up. We're feel, uh, fearful that uh, it'll have no impact. And the good news is that God did not give us a spirit of fear. So if we're fearing that, if we're sensing this fear, that's not from God. We can disregard that. We're free to not obey and listen to that fear we might be fearing. Instead, He's given us power. He's given us love, and he's given us self-control or a sound mind. Maybe for some of us that the gifts we have is, is serving others, helps, or leadership, or administration. And we're, we're wanting to serve our workplace, in our work groups that we have, or in our schools, or if you're a student in, in, in the classroom, or uh, in our family. We're wanting to use these gifts of service and leadership and administration but we feel distracted. We feel like we're, we're going all over the place. We feel like, man, like we, we can't, we don't have the self-control to do it. The good news is that the Holy Spirit has given us the ability to be self-controlled, to be focused, to have a sound mind. He's given us all of that through the gospel. And so that is good news wherever God has placed us, in our families, in our friendships, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, that the Holy Spirit has given us the power to do what we can't do. His commandments are impossible. 
We don't have the ability to do all these things all the time. It's impossible. That's why we need God's Spirit. And, and it's encouraging to know that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. If we think about it, uh, if you're with us in our series through 1 Timothy, Timothy was not like this strong, dynamic leader. He wasn't like that, that type A personality uh, where he was just like really charismatic and could just grab everyone's attention. He wasn't that. In fact, uh, reading Paul's letters to Timothy, Timothy was, was shy. He seemed like a real introvert, timid, because Paul, Paul kept encouraging him to be bold. Uh, so Timothy was not this, this, this leader figure that, that we'd say, wow, this person's going to be something. No, he was kind of like the guy in the background that would kind of be overlooked. And yet, he's being called to pastor a church, which is crazy. Uh, not only that, he had physical struggles. In 1 Timothy, uh, Paul had to direct Timothy, hey, drink some water mixed with wine because of your stomach problems. So D Timothy was, was dealing with physical struggles. He was not this strong, dynamic leader. And yet, he was stepping into a situation that was beyond his ability. Maybe a lot of us feel that way. Like in the workplace, you feel like, man, the boss wants me to lead this group or do this project. I don't feel like I have the stuff to do. Good news is, we have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. We may feel like our calling our families, or at school, or in certain community events that we're involved with. We feel this sense of inadequacy. And you know what? That's good. Because if we think we're adequate, then we're not going to rely on God. But if we recognize, wow, I cannot love people consistently. I cannot serve my coworkers consistently because I get super irritated with them. I can't always be patient with my family members, my kids, my parents, my siblings, because it's impossible every single day, especially within the times that we're living in. I can't do it. And that's good news because it, it, it makes us turn to God and say, God, I need the power of the Holy Spirit to love uh, the people around me, to serve them with the gifts God has given me in, with a sound mind and self-control. And so we have all of that in the gospel. And God gets glory when he uses people who know that they don't have what it takes uh, to serve him. Because no one does. That's when Jesus had to come. And so my question for us as we lead into worship through singing is where in our life do we need to ask the Holy Spirit for help? Maybe it's in a friendship where we need the Spirit's power to serve that friend. Maybe it's in the workplace where we need self-control to really work hard and work well with all the new restrictions that we've been given in the workplace, whether it be masks or social distancing or cleaning a ton of things all the time. And then we need self-control. Maybe that's where we need to ask for the, for the Holy Spirit to help us. Or maybe it's in certain family relationships, uh, certain relationships within our, our neighborhoods or communities where we need the power of the Spirit to use our gifts to serve those around us out of love. So where in our areas do we need the power of the Holy Spirit? We're going to spend a minute now, about a minute, where to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what areas do we need, especially to be asking for his power, his love, his, uh, for a sound mind. And we're going to lead into uh, singing and communion. So let's, let's spend about a minute right now uh, in quiet prayer to God.
Father, we thank you that through the gospel, we experience a joy for others as they come to know you. Uh, sincere faith that it truly experiences, uh, experiences you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You give us, us a spirit-empowered uh, service to love our neighbor as and so we pray that we, as we lead into singing, Lord, we just respond to all the treasures we have in Christ uh, in this morning. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go ahead and lead through a time of worship. So uh, we have communion available in the back. And if you're joining us online, you can grab your communion elements as we uh, eat of the cracker uh, that represents his body and drink of the juice of the wine that represents his body blood as we eat and drink we are renewed in god's grace that's one of the ways we worship god is through remembering what jesus has done with us, uh, for us on the cross the second way we worship is through financial giving you can do that online at harvardnewwana.org let's go ahead now and respond to the good news of jesus through singing and through community